sharing my screen. And let me open up the lecture. So this is module one. Module one is our basics, our very, very basics. And in this class, I'm not just going to talk to you about how to write a program. I'm going to talk to you about how to read it. Because one of the things that most programming classes don't do is they don't tell you how to translate what you're doing into some form of English. Um, not everybody I know speaks computerese. And so we need to go through these steps so we can learn to not only write syntax, but read and understand what it is that we're trying to write. So programs have a flow. All programs have the same flow. Input, process, output. That's it. Input is anything external into the script or the program. You can think of typing on a keyboard. You can think of a mouse. You can think of a game console. All of that is input. Process is what we do with that input. Do we do a mathematical calculation? Do we display a lightsaber on the screen? Um, what do we do with that data? Process is what you're going to be doing a lot of in this class. Output are um, the results of the input pro plus the process. So, and I'm sorry, output would have been displaying a lightsaber on the screen. Um, so those are the three steps. And if you remember those three basic steps, it will make it easier. It will make it a little less abstract. So the other thing I'm going to be doing in the first two lectures is I'm going to be demonstrating things with flowcharts. Flowcharts are a agno uh, language agnostic programming tool. So what they do is they help you determine the flow of your program. Um, Starting in Module 3, we're going to transition over to pseudocode because you have a lot of pseudocode that you also have to do in this class. So what you see on the right-hand side of the screen is a flowchart, just input, process, output. There's always a start and there's always an end. Now, the, the input, process, and output is going to get more complex as we go through this class. But for this week, you are dealing with input, process, and output. And I'm going to sound like a broken record with, a, with certain things in this class. So the basic building block, one of the basic building blocks of programming in Python is the variable. And a variable can be viewed as a bucket. It's just a place to store a piece of data. So that input, that typing you're doing or whatever, it's going to be assigned to a variable. And that variable is how we will reference that piece of information throughout the running program. And that is, in fact, the entire purpose of a variable is to store data. A variable has three properties. It has a scope, it has a name, and it contains a value. Scope we will begin to talk about in Module 3 because that's when scope becomes relevant. Name is could be Fred. There are certain naming conventions that you have to be careful of in Python. For instance, you can't use special symbols. I think the underscore is the only thing you can use in a variable name in Python. You can use all the letters. You can use all the numbers as long as the variable name starts with a letter. So a variable has a name. And then it contains a value because it is a container. It really is a place in, in your running memory of your computer that stores whatever piece of information you give it. OK. All variable names, let's start with a calculator. In most of these slides, there's going to be rules at the bottom. They're just things for you to remember. OK. Variable names may not include spaces or special characters. Let's see how to define a variable. Amount is a variable name. Now, how do I know it's a variable name and not something else? Well, because it is on the left-hand side of a single, up, a single equal sign. A single equal sign in Python is the assignment operator. 
what it's doing is it's taking the value on the right hand side of that single equal sign and placing it in a place in memory called amount and that place in memory is called amount because we told Python to do it by this syntax. So what does that storage look like? It looks like this. Python has a storage area. There is the name amount and next to it there's going to be the value 10. Every time I use amount in a calculation, Python will give me back the value 10. Okay, so amount is 10. And it stays that way until I reassign amount. So I could say later on that amount is 12, and then every time I used the, the variable amount, I would get the value 12. So that's when, when you're trying to think about a variable, this is how to visualize it. It's a name and a value, and it's kind of like in a table. And when you use that name, you get the value. Now, why wouldn't I just use 10 if amount is 10? That's because I want to make my program data-driven. And this is a concept that we're going to talk about throughout this class. Basically what that means is I can plop any other piece of data of the same type into a function, into a process in my program, and I am assured of getting out the right answer. So if I only use 10 to do my, all my calculations, I will only have calculations that are valid for the number 10. But I want calculations that are value f that are valid for every integer out there. So that's why you use a variable. It allows you to drive your program with data and it makes it much more flexible. Okay, so using a variable. I have a variable called total coins. I know it's a variable because it is on the left hand side of a single equal sign. Zero is on the right hand side of that equal sign. So total coins has a value of zero. Now, I have a few extra things going on here. I have a function call on the next line. Well, first I have a variable name called nickel count and I have a variable name called dime count. So I have three variables. Now, okay, so I have three variables, total coins, nickel count, and dime count. You'll notice that total coins is used again after dime count. It's the same variable. I'm just reassigning the value. So you don't have two variables named total coins. You can only have one variable name. Sorry, let me put it a different way. Variable names are unique throughout your script. You cannot have two variables of the same name. So if you see a variable used twice in a script, it's, it's the same variable. It's just being used twice in a script. So let's see, what else did I put on here? Okay, so the assignment operator is a single equal sign. And in module three, you will wonder, understand why I keep saying single equal sign. So I can use the nickel count and the dime count in a calculation for total coins. And then I can, in this case, print total coins, which will be an output. And we'll talk about input and output in just a few minutes. All right, there are four types of variables, four basic types of variables. There's string, integer, float, and Boolean. We're not going to deal with Boolean until module three. String is just an ordered collection of letters. Integer is a whole number, and float is a number with decimal places. That's all you have to remember about the three data types. Um, so if I have a string, I, will, I have a variable called myster. 
Meister is a variable, and I know it is because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of that single equal sign is the value Lisa. Now, I know the value Lisa is a string because it's inside quotes, matched quotes. In this case, it has an opening double quote and a closing double quote. I have an integer called my int. I know it's an integer. I know it's a, a variable name because it's a, on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side is the number 42. I know it's a number and not a string because it does not have quotes. I have a variable called my float. I know it's a variable. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side is a float. Now I know it's not a string because it. There are no quotes around it. And I know it's not an integer because it has a decimal place. So those are the three types of variables that we're going to be dealing with in week one and week two. Okay, so we're going to talk about functions here, and then I'm going to run some scripts so that you guys can start to see how things are working, start seeing about PyCharm. Python provides a massive amount of functionality. We don't even begin to scratch the surface in this class of the functionality available in Python. And you get a lot of this stuff for free. And most of the stuff that we're going to use in this class, most of the functionality, is part of the standard Python packaging. You don't have to do anything special. It's just there. Excuse me. As we get a little later on into the class, we'll start using imports excuse me, which will bring external things, external functionality in. And functions have a very specific format. They have a function name and at minimum an open and closing uh, yeah, parentheses. The function name is very much like a variable name. It, it follows the same rules. And by the way, you cannot have a function name and a variable name as the same thing. They have to be different. There's an opening parenthesis and a closing parenthesis at a minimum. There's additional things that we're going to add in between those parentheses. Because a function will have, a lot of functions will have arguments in between the parentheses. And that can be, uh, it's often a value. Sometimes it can be some other things. So the first type of functions we're going to learn about is conversion. Actually, let me go down here. Does anybody? I'm sorry. No, no, no questions yet. Okay, that's cool. So, here's variable.py. Anyway, by the way, all of these um, scripts are going to be the just part of the description on the YouTube channel for this video. So. This is just a script called variables. This is just an example of how to define a variable and how to call a function because print is our output part of the input process and output in this class. So let me module one variable. Where are you? There it is. Okay. So this is just a script. And by the way, this is PyCharm. PyCharm is the tool, the IDE, the um, development environment that you will be using in this class for the next eight weeks when it comes to doing programming assignments. And I often use PyCharm in my examples because of something called the debugger. I find the debugger very, very helpful. I use it in my professional life all the time. Um, so I'm going to run this through the debugger, and we're going to watch how things change. First of all, let's just read through it for a minute. I have my var. My var is a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right is the value 10. So every time I see the variable my var, I can assume that the value is going to be 10, at least through line 5. Then on line 7, I reassign my var to, val to the value of 12. So when I use it on line 9, it's going to be 12. 
And then I just have an example of printing down here. So let's run through this. Well, let's run through this in the debugger. So up here in the right-hand corner of my pie charm, I have an arrow, which is run, and a bug, which is debug. Now, I happen to like the debugger, and I'm about to show you why. I hit the debug, and what you will see down here on the lower part of the frame is you'll see console, and you'll see frames and variables. Console is input. When you have, we aren't, we aren't doing it in this one, but in the next one we will. When you have to put input something to it, you're going to do it through the console. Now a lot of people aren't used to putting things into the console. They're used to their iPhones and they're used to the game consoles that they have. This is a text user interface, the TUI. So you're going to be typing into the console. Then there's this thing called frames and variables. I don't use frames much, but I do use variables all the time. And it tells me what variables have what value at any point in time. Now, on module one and module two, those, it's not, it's valuable, but it's not hugely valuable. In module three, it starts to get really valuable. But I like to start practicing it from the beginning, even though you guys don't have to do anything with PyCharm until next week. So what do I have here? I have my lines of code. I have a red dot, and I have a blue line. The red dot, and I can put that red dot on and put that, turn that red dot off. The red dot tells PyCharm to stop on that line before actually executing it. So that, because I want to see what's going to change in my program when I execute it. So whenever I see this bright blue line here, it means this is where I'm at. I haven't executed the line yet. And then over here on the lower left-hand side, uh, sorry, up here on this part of the, uh, this part of the debugger window, I have step over, step into, step into my code, and then step out. We're going to use step over a lot for the first couple weeks. Getting into to week five, we're going to start doing the step into. So I'm now going to step over this line of code and watch what happens with special variables. I executed line three. Now, the nice thing is that PyCharm puts this little shadow thing up here. This is my var colon 10. So that tells me at any point in time what the value of my var is. Again, doesn't seem that important in module one. By module three, it's going to seem really important. And module four, it's going to be kind of imperative. So print is a function. Okay? It is a built-in function from Python. And it outputs stuff to the console. It outputs data to the console. And this is the console. So what I'm telling Python to do here with a call to the print function and saying, Python, output to the console the value of my var and a space. Now, if I didn't have this thing here, and we'll go through print in a, in a few minutes. If I didn't have that there, it would print a new line. So I'm going to step over that line. And what happens down here in the console? It prints out 10. If I step over line 7, you will see the value of my var has been changed to 12. Same variable, different value. And if I go here under frames and variables, you will see I have one variable named my var, and it is now the value of 12. So I'm going to step over print, and it's going to output to the console my value, which is 12. And then I'm just printed out some escape sequences. And then I finished. So in a nutshell, that's PyCharm. That's how you run through a program, and we're going to do a lot of that in this class. So let's go back here. Converting types. Sometimes in Python, we need to change one type to another. Often, you're going to end up changing an integer or a float to a string. 
or you're going to change a string from the input into an int usually. So let's take a look at some examples. I have my stir equal quote 42 quote. That means that even though it's got the number 42 in it because it has those quotes around it, it's a string. And I cannot use a string in mathematical calculations. It's got to be an integer or float. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert it to an integer. And the way I do that is I have a function called int. int just says expect a string that has an integer in it and return me the integer value. So I would say int myster and I would get back 42. Now what I get back is then available to be used in mathematical functions. So I have a string myster. It's now 3.14 but it's in quotes so it's a string so I can't use it again in, an, in a mathematical calculation. So I'm going to convert float using the float function. Float, open parentheses, myster, close parentheses, is going to return the value 3.14. And I can convert a float or an integer to a string using the stir function. And what that allows me to do is that allows me to take an integer and incorporate it into a string. Maybe I have, you know, some stuff I need to print out that's got the, val the values from calculations. And I want to concatenate that with other strings so I can print that out to the user. This is how you would do that. So these are very simple. It's one argument, which is... Um, of the right type. So for int and float, that type is a string. And for string, it's a, an integer or a float. And then you get back what you have asked for. OK, input and output. Input and output are functions that are provided by Python. They're just part of the standard library. And what they allow is they allow interaction with the console. So input allows me to type something in on the console and have Python grab that stuff from the console and bring it into the running program. Print takes something from the running program and it outputs it to a user. So it outputs it to the console on the computer screen somewhere. And for us, that somewhere is going to be in the PyCharm console. So let us look at another script. Uh, what's this one? Nope. Uh, sure, we'll do this one. This one's real simple. So this is just inputting two numbers and then outputting the product of the numbers. So, and by the way, this is a, a multi-line comment. If you are in Python, you can either have the hashtag or you can have three quotes, a bunch of letters, and the ending with three quotes. And so this is just a big multi-line comment. I have here num1, num2, and then I'm going to output it. Now, one thing to notice about Zybooks is Sometimes, but not most of the times, Zybook will expect you to have a string inside your input. So a couple of them are going to ask for the strings inside the input function, but most of them are going to have you call input like this because they don't want to deal with this. But I wanted to show you the difference when we're running this program. So I'm going to go to... 3.14, 1.34, that's it. And now I'm just going to debug this program, and we'll see what happens in the debugger. So I'm on line 13. By the way, it never stops with comments. Pi, all of this stuff between line 2 and line 11 is just a comment. It, Python's going to ignore it. So I have variables and I've got my console. 
So the first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to step over line 13 and nothing happens. There's this kind of reddish area here, but Python is in a place right now of suspension. It is waiting for me to input something because I said input, even though I didn't actually tell them anything. So I'm going to input 42. Whoops, my bad. I'm going to input 42 on the console, and you'll see that num1 is 42. Now I'm going to step over this line. Here you're going to see input another number. That is this string right here. So if there is a string as an argument to the input function, that string will be output to the console. It's like a direction telling me what I need to do. I need to input another number, and I'm going to input the number 12. I'm going to hit the Enter key, because I have to hit the Enter key for input to work. Now, you'll also notice that, oops, my bad. Let me start this again. Okay, let's debug it. There we go. So, I'm going to go to the console. I'm going to step over that line. I'm not going to type inside the program. I'm going to do 42. Hit the Enter key so it goes to the next line. Now I'm going to step over that line. It's going to say input another number. I'm going to say 12. Hit the Enter key. Now it's going to print num1 plus num2. So print is the output. Input was the input, so I got 42 and 12 into the program right here, 42 and 12. And I'm going to output num1 plus num2. Now, num1 plus num2 means that num1 and num2 have to be integers or floats. And the way I know in my program that I can do that addition is that I've got int here. So, and this is something that it's kind of, and I don't think Zybox does a great job of explaining. You can put a function inside of another function. And all this does is Python's going to call the innermost function first. So it's going to call input. Then whatever you give to input, it's then going to pass automatically to int. So I know that num1 and num2 are integers, and I can go here to my variables, and I can double check that. Num1 is an int, and num2 is an int. So now I can add them together and output them to the console. So I'm going to step over, and there is 54. So that is what input and output is for us. And it's, yeah. It's using the console as a way to get data in and, da and information out of, the, out of your running program. It seems kind of rudimentary right now, but this is going to get more and more complex. And it's going to be how I'm going. If, I, if you're in my class, I will be running your programs in PyCharm and expecting input and output to be proper, to be what is required. OK. Nobody has any questions yet? OK. So let's look. Actually, I just did that. So I'm not going to go over this graph, other than to say we have input, process, output. That's what was in the other function. So yeah, you can call one function inside of another. and. Um, for every open parenthesis, you have to have a closed parenthesis. Your parentheses have to be balanced. If you have an open parenthesis, somewhere in that parenthesis chain, you have to have a matching clo closed parenthesis. OK, so let's talk about the print function for a minute. The print function is the way we get stuff to the console. And print can be called with one argument or two arguments. This is a nice feature of PyCharm, and we're going to learn more about it in Module 5. Sorry, of Python. We're going to learn more about it in Module 5. But some of the times we're going to call print with a single argument. Sometimes we're going to call it with a second argument. And so 
what what is in front of me right now is print colon three two one go exclamation point. So all that's going to do is it's going to output that to your console, and that'll print three two one go. Easy enough. Then it can be called with two arguments. And why would I want to do that? Well, print automatically puts a new line. It's like you hit the carriage return after every time it prints. But sometimes you don't want that. And in some labs, you don't want that. You want to be able to control whether or not it puts a new line or not. And the way we do this is we have a second argument for print. And that argument is end equal and then you give it what it's going to be the end. Sometimes it's going to be a pipe. Sometimes it's going to be an equal sign. Sometimes it's going to be a space. And sometimes it's not, that argument's not going to be there. If that argument is not there, if there is no end equal, then it is always a new line. If it is end equal, then whatever that end is, is going to be placed directly after whatever the first argument is. So in this case, going to be line one space. Now between argument one and argument two, and this goes for all functions, you have to have a comma. There has to be some way to separate those functions, those arguments, and the way we do that in Python is a comma. So this is going to print line one, and then it's going to print a space. Sorry, my things are off and then it's going to print continued. So this way I have line one, I've said that I wanted to do a space and then I'm going to use the word continued afterwards. And I'm just going to harp on the fact that for every open parenthesis you have to have a closed parenthesis. Print ends in a new line unless you tell it differently and all arguments are separated by a comma. Okay. Secret life of a Python script. We're just going to follow this through a uh, flowchart. So we're going to say, the following program calculates yearly and monthly salary given an hourly wage. The program assumes work hours per week of 40 and work weeks, of, uh, work weeks per year of 50. So I've got start, input, my input is going to be hourly wage equals int input. That's my input. And I'm going to put in 20 as my hourly wage. Process is going to be what I do with that hourly wage. So I'm going to create count, say, yearly, because I want to figure out how much I'm going to make every year is 20 times 40 times 50. And since hourly, oh, goodness, sorry about that hourly wage what is wrong with me okay let's do this again sorry about that I just noticed that I've had this slide forever okay so input process output we have hourly wage equals whatever somebody puts into it professor Lisa sitting there in front of the computer she puts in 20 so now, what's my process going to be? Well, this word problem is saying I need to calculate yearly and monthly salary given an hourly wage. So I know that there are two calculations, yearly and monthly. So yearly is going to equal hourly wage times 40 times 50. Hourly wage is 20, so it's going to be 20 times 40 times 50, and it's going to be 40,000. Monthly is hourly wage times 40 times 4. Hourly wage is still 20. My process is going to be 3,200. And my output is going to be to the screen. Annual salary is print yearly. And then monthly salary is and then print monthly. So that's the secret life of a Python script. Input, process, output. Oh, and end. Statements and expressions. So there is a difference. And so a statement is an assignment. 
So all assignments are statements. Now, this is just a way to communicate with other programmers of what you're doing. So I'm not going to care if you call it a statement or an expression, but I thought it was important just to bring up. So an expression is a calculation of some sort. Okay, in this case, an expression is area equals int x times int y. And that's the process. And then we have the output, and the outputs are statements. We're not doing anything. We're not altering data. We are simply expressing ourselves to the user. Cases and spaces matter. Python is a case-sensitive, space-delimited language. And this is something that throws even experienced programmers, because not a lot of language, well, m most languages are case sensitive. At least most languages that I've worked with are case sensitive. But they're not space delimited. So let's, let's lead with case sensitivity. What is case sensitivity? Lowercase letter and an uppercase letter are not the same. They just aren't. A lowercase letter x and an uppercase letter x will be treated as two separate variables in Python, just because they're different cases. Space delimited is x equal to y equal 4. That's completely fine. x equal to y equal 4 on the same line is not. Now, some languages like Java and C and C, and C++ have a semicolon. So you tell the compiler or interpreter, in the case of Python, when a line is done, when a statement or an expression is done, you put a semicolon. Python doesn't have that. So you have to make sure that your indentations and your spacing is correct. If not, you're going to get unhappy things happening with Python. Not our characters are visible. Excuse me. Every character has a numeric value, which is why lowercase x is not the same as uppercase x. If you're interested, you can go look up something called the ASCII table, which tells you the numerical expression, the, the number assigned to each letter. The, what a numerical representation does is it allows us to handle non-visible characters. Space, new line, tab, beep. These are all characters that are non-visible. So, um, and Python will have a representation of these. There will be a numerical representation in the ASCII table, but there will also be Python's representation. And Python's representation often includes a backslash. So we will escape T. We'll go backslash T or slash T. I'm sorry, I always get backslash and slash mixed up. And slash N, slash T will be a tab, and slash n will be a new line. And that's important. It's going to be more important next week when we do strings. So handling special characters. This is just a quick table of how you handle special characters in Python. Okay, the backslash, so it was backslash. To have a string with backslash in it, you have to have two backslashes. Because what will happen if you don't is that Python is going to assume you're trying to escape a quote, and we'll treat it as a character and not a quote. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Um, the second example will show you why, though. If my name is John O'Donnell, and I have single quotes on the outside, and I put that little single quote before the D, and I don't have the backslash, Python is going to say, well, you've you know, ended the quote before the D, so Donald quote is invalid. It's going to give you an error. So the only way to have that single quote inside single uh, uh, balance single quotes is to put a backslash. The same thing if you have a quote inside double a double quote inside double quotes, um, and if you want to put a new line or a tab, you have to backslash them. Arithmetic operators, plus, minus, multiplication, division, 
an exponent. And we're also going to do uh, in module three, we're going to deal with the floor operator. But they're pretty much what you have in uh, mathematics. Again, they're just here to kind of say this is what they are as an introduction. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to go over the labs. Now I'm going to go over the labs using flowcharts. After that, if anybody has any questions, let me know. I don't think I've seen any questions in the chat yet. No, that's OK. So let's start with Lab 1.9. So what Lab 1.9 says is complete the program to read four values from input, store the values in variables first underscore name, generic location, whole number, and plural noun. The program uses the input values to output a short story. So let's read through the problem for just a minute. It says read four values from input. That means we're going to have four calls to the input function. And it says it gives us the names of those variables. So we're going to have First underscore name equal input, generic underscore location equal input, whole number equal input, and plural noun equal input. So here is the flowchart. So my program is going to start. I'm going to input first name. I'm going to input generic location. I'm going to input whole number. I'm going to input plural noun. And then I'm going to do the output. And the output line that you have is provided in Zybooks. The trick to this particular, um, this particular lab is to make sure that your function names are identical to what Python is telling you to use for the function names. It can't be first name without an underscore. It has to be first underscore name. So for this one, as you get later on, you won't have to deal with Python telling you what to name your variables. But for this one, you have to name your variables correctly or the print statement they're providing won't work. OK. Lab 2.12, it's got a couple of parts. So a variable like usernum can store a value like an integer. Expand, extend the given program as indicated. So there's going to be somebody's going to be inputting usernum. So we're going to output the user's input, which means we're going output is using the print function. So in this case, it will be print function with user num in between the parentheses. Output the input squared and cubed. Can compare compute squared as user num times user num. So that's going to be another print statement for the second part of it. Actually, there's going to be two because it's going to be the input squared and the input cubed. And then you're going to get a second number, which means you're going to have a second input statement. And it's going to be called user num2. And you're going to output the sum and the product. So this flowchart looks like this. You're going to input user num. You're going to convert user num to an integer. Now, we've seen how to do that a couple of times. You can do it on the same line, but you need to make sure to use the int function. You're going to square the number. You're going to output the squared number. You're going to cube the number. You're going to output the cube number. Then you're going to get an input for the second number. And you're going to convert it to an integer. You're going to sum user num and user num2. You're going to output that sum. You're going to multiply user num by user num2. You're going to output that number. And the program's going to end. So for those three lines that you're reading in the problem, this is the process flow that you're going to need to use. So it's important to know, and you're going through this, if you look back through this, you, what you want to really start with is saying, OK, what things from Zybooks have I learned? Well, I've learned print, so that's got to be output. I've learned input, so that's got to be the input. And this convert user num to integer, well, I know what that is. That's the int function. 
So it's about putting those all together. Oops, I've got a couple more. Sorry about that. Okay. Lab 1.23. Write a programming using integers user num and x as input and output user num divided by x three times. So if it says output, it's the print function. If it says input, it's the input function. So we're going to input integers, which means I have to convert what came in from the input function to an integer using the int function twice, one for a variable called user num and one for a variable called x. So I'm going to start. I'm going to input my user num. I'm going to input x. I'm going to convert user num to integer, convert x to integer. I'm going to divide user num by x. I'm going to say a variable called div equals the pro user num divided by x. I'm going to output that variable, the value of the variable div. Now I'm going to say div2 equals div divided by x. Because I've got to now divide the new value that I care about by x. So I'm going to output div2. I'm going to do this one more time, except this is div3 equals div2 divided by x. I'm going to output div3, and I'm going to end. So this has more process than the other ones because you're going to have to um, do the division three times. But remember, it's not user num divided by x three times. It is user num divided by x gives you a value. That value is then divided by x again, and then the new value is divided by x again. I see a lot of students not get sorry. I see a lot of students getting confused on that part because of the wording of the, que of the question. 2.14, use a program using inputs, age, inputs of age, weight, heart rate, and time, and respectively output the average calories burned for a person. Output each floating point value with two digits after the decimal point, which can be achieved as follows. So, pie charm, sorry, Zybooks is giving you the output function. Okay, you don't have to do anything. It's there in the Zybooks. So what, what you do have to do is you have to input several things and you have to make sure that the variable names, sorry, you have to make sure that the variable name that holds the final value is called calories, lowercase. As you'll see the dot format, open parentheses, calories, close parentheses, that's got to be the variable name. So what you're going to do is you're going to do four inputs. You're going to input age, weight, heart rate, and time, and you're going to convert them. Heart rate to integer, and then time to integer. And then you're going to do the calculation. You're going to calculate calories. Calories has to be the variable name. And then you're going to output it, output that exact print statement. And then you're done. Okay, last lab. So it's a three-part lab. The first thing is you're going to ask the user to input an integer between 32 and 126, a float, a character, and a string. So you're going to have four input statements. And you're going to store each of them into separate variables. Variable names don't matter here. It's just that there has to be four of them. And then you're going to output the four variables on a single line separated by a space. Well, we know how to do that because we saw it when we did end equal. So if you go back and you look at an example in Zybooks, or if you look at this video later, it's when you do the comma end equal quote space quote, is, is that's the right format for the print statement. It's the one with two arguments and not the one with one argument. Um, 
And then we're going to extend also to output the stuff in reverse. And then you're going to convert the integer to a character using the char function and output that character. So what are we going to do? We're going to start the program. We're going to input user int. We're going to input float. We're going to input a character. And we're going to input a string. And then I'm going to output everything in that order separated by spaces only. I'm going to output it in reverse order separated by spaces only. I'm going to convert user int to care. I'm sorry, this is char function. And then I'm going to output the character and I'm done. So that's what you have to do for the three labs. And that's it for that. Now, whoops, okay, yes. Yes, yeah, the um, link that's up here is actually the link to the YouTube channel that will have all of this. Okay, so does anybody have any questions? Okay, going once, going twice. I will have this up tomorrow, most likely. Uh, yeah, most likely in the morning tomorrow, I will have this up. So check out the channel, and it will also have the descriptions. Um, and I will see you guys maybe next week. I will be here. Um, when using care function in Zybook, it gives me an error, is it? It's C-H-R. It's C-H-R. Okay. And by the way, if you're in my class, don't hesitate to reach out. Everybody have a wonderful weekend, and um, I will talk to you later.